Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Philosophy. This is Professor Paul Hicks, and we are going to talk about an ethics paper today written by uh, Garrett Hardin. Now, Garrett Hardin was not, strictly speaking, a philosopher. He was actually an ecologist, but uh, this particular paper is actually rather influential, and so it gives a very good uh, perspective on this particular position. Now, let's see whether you actually agree with it or not. Um, as we get through the actual paper. So the paper is actually called Lifeboat Ethics, The Case Against Helping the Poor. So um, he starts off and he says that, look, some people have said that we should look at this planet as if it's some sort of spaceship, right? And that no single person or institution has the right to destroy, waste, or use more than their fair share of resources. But he wants to get rid of this kind of thing. He says, let's go ahead and use a metaphor of a lifeboat if we can. So imagine that there's a lifeboat floating in the uh, ocean and it has a capacity to hold 60 people in it. Now, currently there are 50 people in the lifeboat, but there's 100 people around the lifeboat who are drowning in the water around us. So the Christian ideal of being our brother's keeper would say that we must take in all the people. But what's going to happen if that's the case? If we took in 100 people when the boat will only hold 60, then the entire boat would sink and everybody would die. And so what we have here, he says, is we might have justice, but you also have catastrophe. And so complete justice equals complete catastrophe in this particular uh, example. And just because also, he says, but remember, there's only 50 in here and it could support 60. Should we allow in, say, 10 more? He actually wants to argue against that as well. He says, we need to leave ourselves what he calls a safety factor. So, for example, in agriculture, we should allow for a surplus of food rather than just the right amount in case something happens, like some sort of plant disease or something like that. So we need to give ourselves a little room here. And you know what? I'm in the boat. They're not. That's just too bad for them. Um, so he says, look, let's look at the world that we live in. And he says the lifeboat here is very much similar to that. Those of us who are in wealthy nations are in the lifeboat. Those who are poor are just drowning in the ocean around us. So he wants to give out a few facts. Now, keep in mind that this paper was written back in the 70s, and some of these stats have changed, but he's got, there's the same kind of reasoning is still going on. So the facts, when he writes this, is he says, currently, two-thirds of the world is in poverty. Only one-third is considered rich. The United States, of course, being the wealthiest nation. The richer nations have a population growth, he says, of about 0.8% a year, while poor nations have a population growth of about 3.3% a year. Rich nations will double their population every 87 years, but poor nations will double it every 21 years. So if you're from a poor nation, you're more likely to have kids and um, you're going to have a greater and greater and greater population increase. All right. So if we were to take responsibility, say, for famine and the poor people in this world, he says, just like in the lifeboat, we're all going to suffer from it. Complete justice equals complete catastrophe. So why is that? Well, because the poor reproduce faster than the rich, if we allowed for a one-to-one -one ration now, in 87 years, there will be eight times more poor than there are rich. Every American would have to share their food supply with eight others. Okay, but here's a possible objection to that. Who knows that whether the current population trends will continue? Here's how Hardin answers that. He says, look, you're right. Most likely the rate of population increase will decline much faster in the U.S. than it will in other countries. The more affluent the country is, the less, uh, the more affluent a, a person is, the less likely they are to have a bunch of kids. This is going to produce what is often referred to as the tragedy of the commons. So let's think about the tragedy of the commons for a bit. So the reason, why do we allow for private property? We allow for it because those who own private property will take responsibility for it. So for example, a farmer is not going to put more cattle in the pasture than the capacity allows for. All right, if he did, erosion would set in, weeds would take over, and he would ultimately lose the use of the pasture altogether. If we were to open up the pasture for anybody to use, we're also going to suffer because there's always going to be somebody who thinks their needs are greater than others. 
that person will take more than they need and they're going to ruin it for everybody. Without control, mutual ru ruin is inevitable. All right, think about it this way. Um, imagine that we didn't actually own cars. So we didn't all have our own individual car. And what we shared cars. Will you take as much responsibility to keep that car that's not really yours clean in good running condition to make sure that lasts a long time? Or if you had your own car, your own personal property, are you going to take care of it more than if it was shared? All right, and Harding thinks it's going to be you know, very clear. If we own something, it is on us to take care of it. We will be the ones to take care of it. But if everybody owns it, and nobody's going to take care of it. And it's just going to go wasted, and it's going to get broken, and it's going to be unusable. Uh, he gives us an example of considering pollution. So the air and water have all become polluted because we've allowed an equal access to use it. This holds true for fishing. Technological improvement has hastened the disappearance of fish. This is still true today. So only the replacement of the system of the commons with a responsible system of control will save the land, air, and water, and the oceanic fisheries. Right? When we let anybody just go ahead and fish, then everybody's going to do it, and they're going to, there's going to be less fish. Right? We're going to ruin the ecological systems. So some people have proposed that we create a world food bank. So what do we mean by this? Well, richer nations will produce more food than they need. So they should store that into some sort of bank so that when poor countries that are going through, say, a famine, they can go ahead and withdraw the extra food that the rich countries don't actually need. Right? So rich people put in the excess food and poor people take out the food that they actually need. Well, this is a problem for Hardin because he says it's going to fail for three reasons. Um, the first is that it's going to create an industrial complex. So what do we mean by that? Their people are going to make money off of this program, and they will continue to want to further the program, not because it is helping people or anything like that. They want to further the program because they're making money off of it. They're getting rich off of it. Now, who are we talking about here? Who is actually going to make money if we put in together some sort of world food bank? Well, farmers are going to make more money. Anybody that manufactures farm machinery, fertilizers, pesticides, they're going to make more money. Makers of grain elevators that store the excess food supply, railroads and shipping lines without carry it. There will be a government bureaucracy required to administer their program. And this would be wanted to be con continued even if it's not actually useful. So these special interests would overtake the program for their own greed, rather than for the supposed benefit of the people. So the first problem with the World Food Bank, he says, is going to be the industrial complex. The second problem, he says, for the World Food Bank is going to be that poor countries will never learn to take care of their own needs if they're just going to be able to rely on rich people to do everything for them. He says any competent nation knows that emergencies is going, are going to happen from time to time, and they're going to prepare themselves for this and save up for an emergency. He says, quote, some countries will deposit food in the World Food Bank, and others still withdraw it. There will be almost no overlap. As a result of such solutions to food shortage emergencies, the poor countries will not learn to mend their ways and will suffer progressively greater emergencies as their population grow. All right, well, now he says, you know, you know there's going to be an objection. He says some kind-hearted liberals are going to argue, but hey, it isn't their fault. How can we blame poor people who are caught up in an emergency? Why must they suffer for the sins of their government? Well, his answer here is blame is not relevant here. It's a matter of operational consequences. Slovenly rulers will not be motivated to mend their ways if we do this. So in order to teach slovenly rulers, we need to allow people to suffer in order to teach the ruler a lesson, right? Um, think about that for just a bit and whether that's actually kind of contradicting something that he might be saying. Um, he says blame is not relevant here, but isn't he calling them slovenly rulers? Um, isn't he blaming rulers? I don't know. That's, I've always had a problem with that part. So, you know, just think about that. Okay, so once again, the 
you know, first objection to the World Food Bank is the industrial complex. The second objection is these bad rulers will not actually learn to take care of their people. And the third objection that he has is population control. He says population growth in poor countries, as already discussed, is greater than in rich countries, and the need will continue to grow without limit, but the supply will not. So what famine is, it's a means of controlling population. When we feed the poor, it simply allows them to re reproduce more. The more we feed them, the more they're going to reproduce and create more poor people. So if we stop feeding poor people, then they won't be able to reproduce, right? According to Hardin, if we help poor people and they reproduce, they're just creating more poverty and they're creating more suffering. And so poor people should not reproduce. He actually likens it. He talks about a particular quote here. He says, um, he likens it to the growth and spread of humanity over the surface of the earth to the spread of cancer in the human body, remarking that cancerous growths demand food. But as far as I know, they have never been cured by getting it. And so poor people are like a cancer on, on, on the world. If we feed them, it makes it worse. If you feed a cancer, it makes the cancer worse. Um, you know, the fact is, is that he says we're overloading the environment, right? All humans are going to constitute a drain on the environment. They're going to need food, air, water, right? The forest, the beaches, wildlife, scenery, all solitude. It's all going to suffer the more people we have. So even if we solve the problem of food, it doesn't do anything to solve these other problems. The fact is, the more people we have, the worse our environment is. Um, so let's talk about immigration here for just a bit, if we can, because this clearly is going to have um, some impact on our views of immigration. Remember, poor people are in the ocean surrounding the lifeboat and are trying to get in. And he uses this metaphor, should we allow people from poor countries to come into a rich country like the United States? Um, he says, look, anybody, he quotes, anybody who publicly questions the wisdom of current U.S. immigration policy is promptly charged with bigotry, prejudice, ethnocentrism, chauvinism, isolationism, or selfishness. But perhaps we still feel guilty about things we said in the past. See, two generations ago, the popular press frequently referred to uh, derogatory terms like doggos, wops, Polacks, chinks, krauts. In articles about how America's being overrun, they said, by foreigners of supposedly inferior genetic stock. But because the implied inf inferiority of foreigners was used then as a justification for keeping them out, people now assume that any restrictive policies could only be based on those previous misguided notions. But what Hardin wants to say is we're not being racist here. As Just because people in the past did not want immigrants coming here because of, they were racist, he says, I'm not being racist. I, I'm basing this, my position on other grounds. He says, consider the growing use of birth control devices. The potential effect of education campaigns by organizations like Planned Parenthood uh, or zero population growth, uh, the influence of inflation and the housing shortage, the fertility rate of American women may decline so much that immigration could account for all the yearly increase in population. Should we not at least ask if that is what we want? Do we really want immigrants coming here and reproducing, or do we want American women to reproduce? So here's the thing. Is, is it really going to be the case that American women are going to stop having babies altogether? I don't see that as being true. Right? Even if we do let immigrants in, I'm not sure that's actually going to be true. Um, he says, like the World Food Bank, immigration comes from selfish interest. Why do we allow immigrants in here that are undocumented? Well, employers, they want cheap labor for industries that offer rather degrading work, and they know that immigrants will take it. Um, also, like the Food Bank, the World Food Bank, there's this liberal intelligentsia, and they're afraid of being called mean, they're afraid of being called bigots, so they refuse to close the doors on immigration because they don't want to be labeled as something horrific like a bigot. Hardin says if we allow for immigration, then what we're doing is we're stealing from our children. We're stealing not just from ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren. The land and the resources that we want to give to them 
will not be available if we let immigrants in and we let immigrants use our resources. And so in order to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren, we need to exclude immigrants altogether. All right. Well, at this point, he says, look, I can hear U.S. liberals asking, how can you justify slamming the door once you're inside? You say that immigrants should be kept out, but aren't we all immigrants or the descendants of immigrants? I mean, if we insist on staying, must we not admit all others? He says our craving for intellectual order leads us to seek and prefer symmetrical rules and morals. That is a single rule for me and everybody else. The same rule yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Justice, we feel, should not change with time and place. Right? He says this is actually absurd. This is absolutely absurd to have right, the one rule for everybody. He says, look, if we hold this kind of argument then what are we going to have to do? Right, We're going to have to give back our land to all the American descendants of the indigenous people of North America. And his response to that is, no matter how morally or logically sound this proposal may be, he says, I'm not willing to do it, and I don't know anybody else who is. Right, I'm not willing to do it, and I don't know anybody else who is. So, all right, so what are some potential problems here for uh, the lifeboat ethics? One I've already kind of talked about where he talks about, you know, blame is not relevant here. And then he goes on one sentence later to blame bad rulers. That seems kind of weird. Also, the idea that a group of people will be kept in check by famine and crop failures. This is what we're going to call a passive genocide. It is a genocide of people, not because we are actually killing them, but we are refusing to help them. Right? Famine and crop failures are a good thing for human population because it kills off the poor people. Um, another problem I see here is, really, are we in a lifeboat? Right? See, Harden talks about um, the Earth's ability to support people is limited because our resources are limited, but what number can it support? Have we actually reached that number? Maybe instead of saying that we're a lifeboat, maybe we're a large luxury cruise liner with plenty of additional room that we can have. But we just don't want those people who are drowning around us, right? The future is never known with the degree of certainty required by the problem. There is, for example, a real chance that the lifeboat will hold more or that help will arrive or that people will volunteer to leave the boat or that other solutions will be found by some sort of ingenuity, right? The problem here is the United States and developed nations, they consume more than what we need. The lifeboat is not a good analogy here. So the lifeboat has limited resources, but the United States is actually taking resources from other countries and leaving them without resources, right? We have to ask ourselves a question. Why are poor people poor? Why do people continue to be poor? And did we do anything to cause it? Or are people poor just because they're lazy? Are we really going to say that all, everybody in poor countries are just lazy? I mean, is that going to come off as you know pretty racist and <laughs> certainly xenophobic? Um, what did we do in other countries when we took their resources? Say, if you go down to, say, Latin America, for example, um, that used to have gold and a lot of silver. Well, white countries came in and took all of that stuff. Right? We stole it from them, and now they don't have anything. So anytime that they had resources... That we just took it. The same could be said for oil or any other kind of natural resources that people have. Um, you know, maybe we don't need to have an equal share of resources, but couldn't we say at least we should have a minimum share of resources? Yeah, you know, I may not need as much food on my plate as you, but can I at least have some? Right? Do we? Is it real? Is is he really asserting all of this that people are everyone's just going to starve? All right, so there's some problems with Garrett Harden. Go ahead and think uh, those thoughts through, and I will see you next time. Have a good day, guys. Bye.